All right, we're going to finish this off with swine breeds and swine, and then we're going to go directly into camelids. Uh, so here are the major swine breeds. Um, I had some other breeds um, put up there with some, you know, to let you guess, but uh, then I went to do some research and some of them had, some of the major ones in the United States had changed a little bit. So I want to make sure you had the most common ones that we see in the United States. Um, so um, the ones that I see around here most often are the Hampshire, Berkshire, Poland, China, but also the land race in the Yorkshire. So I don't see a lot of Duroc or Spotted or Chester White, although I may be wrong on that, I don't see a lot of swine. So um, in the ones that I do see um, showing at fairs and uh, with my friends that are breeders, those are If you look at um, swine over the centuries, they're, they have completely changed in the way that they look. A um, lot more muscle, um, they're a lot faster growing, with that comes a lot more meat, but also can come some problems. So we're going to kind of go over some of the things that we see with these guys. So starting with the babies, um, they do can get hypoglycemic. We want to make sure they're nursing. They don't have diarrhea. So that's the first thing. Um, secondly, uh, most of our swine in this country are raised inside. So they're not on the ground. They're not rooting through the soil. They're not getting iron. So we see a major iron deficiency in their moms and then also in the babies. So they do need to get injected with iron by the time they're three days old. Um, and moms need to be injected as well. At about three days of age, we do a, a piglet processing um, in which we are you know, after they've settled in with mom for about three days, we pull them and clip their needle teeth. Um, they have sharp little teeth that can cause lots of problems. We see this bloody little tail here, so they will fight with each other and cause a lot of problems. So we'll just trim those, um, castrate them. So quick, quick, snip, snip, um, tail, tail docking. So we don't have, even if they can get a hold with their little teeth, uh, we, we um, can, uh, this is a, some clippers with a, a burning device so we're um, cutting the tail and uh, burning it at the same time um, and so cauterizing it uh, and then um, so tail docking clip the needle teeth castrate them um, you do you castrate them as soon as you can um, three days maybe a little bit too soon um, usually about four months uh, they're easily to see so uh, may do a little sooner than that and obviously an iron injection make sure that we're checking them out make sure everything looks good um, absolutely need to wear a mask gloves and ear protection for this processing um, and just get ready to go mark the ones that you've done because uh, it can get pretty confusing at times um, but uh, they squeal so it'll be really loud all right so things that affect their their body all over so the first one we're going to talk about is erysipelas it is the is one of the first vaccines that um, piglets get um, or should get uh, it is a bacterial disease that causes diamond skin patches so it's called diamond patch disease or diamond skin disease it causes gi swelling um, causes heart issues and causes um, severe arthritis this guy is so painful that he's standing on his tippy toes um, to try to keep weight off of his joints. Uh, so this is a pretty significant disease that can cause some issues. Um, even pigs that are uh, not not used for um, uh, not used in for meat production, they're used as pets. Should get, be getting this uh, vaccine. Pseudorabies virus is also known as Ojeski's disease or mad itch. They get so itchy uh, that they will um, they will scratch themselves to death, death and they will look crazy. So it looks kind of look like rabies. They're, they're, they're mad with itch, um, but it is another disease and it's actually reportable. Uh, it can cause death throughout the farm and we have a cat that died in amongst these piglets as well. Um, uh, porcine reproductive and respiratory disease called PERS or blue ear disease, another reportable disease because it can kill them pretty quickly, uh, sudden death. Um, the blue ear is because they're cyanotic. They don't, the blood flow doesn't uh, go to the extremities. Um, it causes um, severe respiratory distress and sudden death. Uh, e. coli, um, just like with us, they can get sick with E. coli. Most of the reason that we get sick from food is because of some fecal-borne material. So it could be a norovirus, uh, which is a fecal-borne 
virus or it could be E. coli, um, which is a fecal born. So uh, don't want to discourage you from eating out, but do be aware that especially at buffets um, or people that aren't trained in food product, food service um, might be passing these things along. And uh, we do, uh, this is a problem with piglets as well. Also transmissible uh, gastroenteritis. This is a little, um, kind of looks like the coronavirus, doesn't it? Um, but this is a, something that um, is passed and causes acute diarrhea and death in swine. Rotavirus and coronavirus, these are two viruses that also in young pigs can cause a lot of problems and clostridial uh, enteritis. So um, very sick piglets that dice of sudden acute di uh, diarrhea. They can also get coccidia. Coccidia in any um, breed or species um, is usually due to poor conditions uh, where they're around feces a lot. So if we can keep the area clean, uh, keep them from eating or being around feces, a lot of feces, that usually keeps the coccidia down. We all have some coccidia in our intestinal tract. That little bit is normal. A lot causing diarrhea is a problem. Some parasites they get, uh, strongyloides, uh, ransomi, or threadworms, um, are, can be a problem. They can also get swine dysentery, um, proliferative um, enteropathy. Um, this one is interesting because it causes what we call garden hose gut. Oh, and let me point out, this is diarrhea in young pigs, so before they leave mom. And then when we put uh, pigs in, in uh, and grow them up and finish them, that means we're getting them ready to go to market. And these are the diseases, that, the diarrhea that we see in these guys. Garden hose gut means we have a severe inflammation and thickening of this gut. Um, and you can see that this look, just looks like a garden hose. It's so thick. Nothing can be digested past that. So that's going to be an uh, animal with severe diarrhea uh, wasting away. They can get salmonella. Um, and once you have salmonella in this environment, it's going to pass through pretty quickly. They also get whipworms. Uh, Trichurus suis is the whipworm. We want to deworm them for that. Respiratory. So this is an interesting one. It's called atrophic rhinitis. It's caused by a number of different things. Bordetella bronchoseptica, just like we have in dogs and cats. Pastorella multacida is another pastorella um, we see this in a lot of species as well. These are two bacteria. Environmental factors. So a lot of hu a huge high mid humidity in the air um, will carry a lot of diseases directly to the nose. High ammonia levels, so if it's not being kept clean, stress, any other concurrent disease, suboptimal nutrition, all of these things together will lead to atrophic rhinitis. Um, these are the, what's called turbinates. These are This is bony structure within their nose that increases the surface area. It increases the surface area, increases their, their um, sense of smell, which is great. Um, but if they have disease, inflammation, infection within this um, nose, it's going to start eating away at the nose and it's going to do it. Sometimes it does it um, symmetrically. Um, and in this case, it's atrophic redness. It does it one-sided. And so it will actually push the nose off to the side, make the nose look crooked. Let's see the bleeding from the nostril, from the chronic infection, inflammation. Um, I call this Coke nose because this is what it would look like if you um, sniff Coke a lot. Or with these guys, it's very similar to the, um, uh, to the reason that we see um, kennel cough in dogs. They also get swine flu. So if you remember H1N1 flu uh, pandemic that was compared to this pandemic, the corona pandemic, very, very mild. Um, this is swine influenza. Uh, the, it, they get a lot of the diseases that humans get. That's why they, there's a lot of um, uh, research that goes on uh, with swine. Um, but it's pretty common uh, to pass that between birds and swine. I have to be very careful on swine farms. Um, mycoplasma pneumonia, um, a mycoplasma bacterium, kind of like tuberculosis, uh, is something that they can get, uh, have difficulty breathing. Uh, we have to treat them. That lincomycin is a, a typical antibiotic that we would treat them with, but we can vaccinate them as well. Pleuronemonia, um, again, we can treat, we can vaccinate um, for this, um, just causing a, a pneumonia on the on the outer lining of the lungs. Pasturella pneumonia. So again, Pasturella, 
and atrophic rhinitis can get down into the lungs and cause a pneumonia. You see that how dark those lungs are. That's necrotic lung tissue. That's a dead lung. Um, tylosin is another, it's like lincomycin, it's another antibiotic that can help kill that bacteria. Musculoskeletal, um, there is a reportable disease called porcine stress syndrome or malignant hyperthermia. It's also called pale soft exudative uh, pork. And these all pretty much um, describes what happens. So um, it's genetic and this is uh, the um, this box is a male that is a carrier uh, for this disease and males uh, it's a link to the X chromosome so the male will carry it on their X chromosome and if the, they breed to a female that doesn't have it then all of their offspring will just be carriers they won't actually exhibit the disease um, if this male that exhibits this disease is bred to an offspring that had it or bred to somebody that is a carrier, doesn't exhibit the disease, but um, is, carries the, at one of the X chromosomes uh, for the disease, then they will have um, two that are carriers and two that, are, uh, that um, have the disease. Now, when you have two X chromosomes that have the disease, you will die. So a female will die from this disease. Um, what we see is this is normal pork. This is pale, soft, exudative pork. So really pale, very spongy. Um, what happens is it basically cooks inside the animal because they get uh, hyperthermia. They get very, very hot um, and they can't regulate their temperature down. Reproductively, they get parvovirus as well. It causes abortions in these guys and it can be any stage of pregnancy. Um, Leptospira pomona and Bratislava. So lepto, if you've heard of lepto, which you have as a disease that we see in dogs, um, they carry it and it can also cause abortions. Salt poisoning. Salt poisoning, I don't know if you know this, but the pigs don't sweat. They need to be in environments that have water and they need to be able to drink plenty of water. If they don't have access to fresh water, um, aren't able to cool themselves, they actually uh, will concentrate um, their urine. Uh, they, they don't concentrate it as well, meaning this, the sodium, the water comes out, but not the sodium. And so they, what they get is a sodium ion toxicosis or water deprivation, um, meaning the, the fluid has left the system, but the salt remains. And this causes a neurologic uh, symptom. They won't be able to move uh, well. They actually look drunk. They as quickly as possible and sometimes the quickest way to do this is rectally so this is an example of a uh, animal getting a rectal infusion of warm water um, I will say that I've seen salt poisoning in dogs um, my own dog ate uh, play-doh um, that is made of lots of salt I didn't realize he ate it he was at my sister's house he ate the play-doh he was acting funny that night. I didn't know why he was acting funny. So I called my sister and asked her, did he get into anything? Oh, no. Oh, well, he ate a little bit of, oh, actually, he ate a lot of Play-Doh. He ate a bag of Play-Doh that I had just made. And uh, I said, oh, and I took some blood on him. I took him into work and took some blood on him. And his sodium was uh, just through the roof. Um, and he, this guy looked like he was drunk. He could barely stand. He was drooling. Um, and so this is what it looks like uh, with pigs as well. Potbelly pigs, so pretty common to have as pets these days. Um, Potbelly pigs, um, some another really great um, breed of pig that is uh, good to have as pet is, are called Cooney Cooney pigs. And just because I like them so much, I'm going to take a minute and show you the Cooney Cooney pigs. Uh, Cooney Cooney pigs come from New Zealand, and they're, they've just started to make a... Um, showing in this country uh, but basically these guys are spotted pigs and they're haired so they have kind of cute little hair and they kind of look like calico little calico pigs um, they graze instead of root you can see their nose a little bit more upright and so they are grazers they won't dig and and uh, make messes in your yard so they just graze and they're as smart as little pigs so they're they're cute little guys that uh that grow up into um, all potbelly pigs actually grow pretty big. Um, 
the only way that you can keep these guys so small is to um, not feed them, to, to malnourish them. Um, so you, you basically starve them to death in order to keep them small, which is inappropriate. Uh, you may have a breeder that gives you a very specific diet and says don't feed more than this and it's actually not sustainable for life, um, so they may not live very long. Um, so they do make pot-bellied pig food. The, the thing is that um, people realize that they're not feeding their pig too much and then they give the pig as much as they want and that's a problem too because then they get super obese. Um, so obesity is an issue. Um, they are very, very smart um, and so they're like having a three-year-old child all the time. So you have to keep them occupied. You have to keep them busy. Uh, and they do get big. They can get 150 to 200 pounds. Um, so it it's, can be difficult to handle. So don't, don't think that these little piglets are going to stay like that because they don't. They do get overheated as well. So you do need to provide them with a cooling off area. They don't really like to get muddy per se. They just want to stay uh, cool. And the only way for them to stay cool is to be in water as needed or in a cool spot. Uh, so you want to feed them um, appropriately, not too little, not too much. Uh, you want to give them a cool spot, watch for obesity. They do get skin uh, conditions, um, some other things, but um, they're actually relatively easy to care for if you like to be challenged. You definitely have to like to be challenged. So if you have any questions about swine, I do want you to go through your the paperwork that I gave you and uh, make sure that you uh, have logged all your questions and uh, we can take a minute in class and talk about that. The next thing we're going to talk about are camelids. Camelids are things that are within the camel family, but they are alpacas, um, uh, llamas, and camels. Um, this is a llama. They have very upright ears. Um, they tend to have a longer, thicker neck, um, a longer face than alpacas. Uh, this is a uh, um, Surrey alpaca, this is a Huaxia alpaca, and this is a Huarito, crossbreeding of a llama and alpaca. Um, this is a camel. This is a camel. You should know the difference between a Bactrian and dromedary camel. Camel. And the easiest way to tell is if you put a B on its side, it would look like this. And that is a Bactrian camel. They have two humps. A dromedary camel only has one hump, just like a D on its side. So it actually makes it easy to remember which is Bactrian, which is dromedary in terms of camels. Camelids have three compartment stomachs. So instead of being a true ruminant and having four stomachs, they have three. And we call them compartment one, compartment two, and compartment three. Compartment one acts very much like the rumen. So they eat um, grasses and they need to be able to digest that, which means they need to be able to ferment those vegetables, that cellular structure. So that's why they have that first compartment. Um, so they are going to uh, ruminate, which means they're going to eructate and chew their cud, um, much like a ruminant. They are obligate nasal breathers. Some, uh, some other obligate nasal breathers that we've talked about are rabbits and horses. They must breathe through their nose. If they are frothing at the mouth and their uh, nostrils are closed, they are in extreme stress, and that is a problem. Um, they are spitters. This is an example of the spit. It is nasty. Um, you might think, oh, it's just spit. It's not just spit. It's pretty mucusy. Um, it smells bad. Um, it is a really good defense mechanism. Um, cool thing about them is that they have communal dung piles. So they will go in one place as a group. That's where that's the place where you have to clean up um, is their communal dung pile. If you want them to go to the bathroom and you want to collect a sample, a fresh sample, take them to the communal dung pile and t chances are that they will eliminate whatever you need them to eliminate. Um, offspring is called a crea and giving birth for these guys is called unpacking. If they are sick, they, are, they get dehydrated really quickly, so they will get hypernatremic. So we just talked about swine getting hypernatremic, so increased sodium, salt poisoning. That's the same thing, increased sodium in their blood. And we have to um, give them fluids uh, to uh, remediate that. So this is what it looks like, a diagram of the llama's stomach. So we have the compartment one, compartment two, little compartment two, and then compartment three, which is kind of the true stomach where the glandular stuff happens. 
So what do we do? We do need to vaccinate them, and uh, it's similar vaccines to what we would give a small ruminant, so Clostridium perfringens type C and D, and tetanus. Um, sometimes they get rabies. There are some other vaccines we might think about with them as well. Um, paras uh, parasites, the most common one that we see with them um, that causes major issues, neurologic issues, would be Paralophus strongulus tenuis, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but also any type of ascarid. Um, will cause problems. So we can deworm them. Um, they do need dental care. Um, they do have teeth uh, that that uh, kind of should be removed. See, these are like wolf teeth and a horse. Um, and they are canines that just are pointing every which direction. Um, they also tend to have um, malocclusions. They, their uh, teeth don't come together normally. And so often we have to float their teeth as well. Uh, foot trimming is a common thing that we need to do as well with them, just like we would do with any small ruminant. Um, taking an, a, a crea to term is very seems to be very difficult for alpacas and llamas, and so they're often born prematurely. A premature uh, crea will have ears that um, don't have a lot of cartilage in them, so they're kind of floppy ears. They'll have a nice silky coat. They'll have kind of a floppy neck that they can't control. That's a sign of a premature crea. Um, because llamas and alpacas uh, came in very small quantities from uh, South America when we first imported them to the U.S., uh, there was a lot of inbreeding that went on. And so what we see is a lot of genetic and congenital abnormalities, abnormalities things that they're born with. Um, the first one we'll talk about is coanal atresia. Coanal atresia uh, refers to the lack of of a rectum, a uh, lack of an anus. And so they don't have any way for feces to exit the body. It's not sustainable and it's not something we typically do um, surgery on. This animal would have to be euthanized. Um, then uh, we also have cleft palates. You can see this is a, a, the lip doesn't fully come across. Here it's even worse. It's completely up there, those are the um, lower teeth. Um, they do have a dental pad, like a small ruminant uh, or a, um, a cow, so they don't have upper incisors. Um, but the other thing they have is a wry mouth, um, so this is pretty severe. This is an upper maxilla and a lower mandible, and they're just kind of scissored on each other and very difficult for this animal to eat. Uh, this is a less um, a severe version of that, so they just don't come into contact as well. So kind of funny faces, wry mouth, um, and cleft palate, and uh, coanal atresia can be a problem. Um, so neonates uh, get coccidia uh, and uh, E. coli, just, um, and they, those causes uh, diarrhea, so we have to be careful of their environment, make sure it's which causes a problem. We can see this um, actually growing throughout the United States. Uh, Giardia is pretty common with these guys as well, so we have to be care careful about clean water for them. Rotavirus and coronavirus um, is something we actually can, we can vaccinate them uh, with a bovine version of this, uh, and this is for young animals primarily. Uh, the, the vaccines, that, or the um, uh, parasites that they get, mostly nematodes or roundworms, um, we can deworm them with a goat dewormer. So take care of that. And then here's the meningeal worm, which is known as per Paralophus strongulus tenuis. I particularly like this one because I did a, a study on it when I was in uh, vet school. Um, but they get it from eating around where snails and slugs are um, from a deer. So the deer will, will eat the snail or slug and become the uh, secondary life or secondary reservoir. And then the alpaca that grazes near where uh, deer droppings are, we'll eat this L1, and then it will go through their system. You can see it grows up um, as an L, and this is the third stage of the larvae that has made it to the spinal cord and causes paralysis. Now we can give them pretty intensive treatment. It doesn't always work. We have to do a lot of supportive care, and a lot of times these guys are just euthanized. Hepatic lipidosis, we see this in cats. And what we see is that the animal is overweight and so has a lot of fat in its system. So we do a body condition score to make sure that they're not. Um, and if they stop eating, so they, if they uh, stop eating, they'll go through this uh, ketone 
uh, ketoacidosis and it will start breaking down fat and the fat will go into the liver. And when the fat fills the liver, then the liver doesn't function normally. And so the same thing with cats, we have to force feed these guys. The other thing we see with these guys is heat stress. So with heat stress, they're very susceptible to heat. Remember, these are uh, animals that live in a cold climate in the mountains. Um, so in our environment, uh, during the summer, they're going to get really hot. We need to provide lots of water and fan and shave their belly. Um, they will start panting, and they will get, if they're a male, get a scr uh, scrotal swelling as well. So if we're seeing that, we need to get them cooled down pretty quickly. So if you have any questions about camelids, uh, now's the time to write them down. Um, go back through this if you um, forgot or your paperwork, which has all the information in it as well, and we can talk about this in class.